Um, we'd like to take this opportunity uh, to thank our funder, Arts Council England, for supporting our work. So before we launch into the categories um, of the awards and, and, and learn more from our partners and past winners, we thought it would be a good time to kind of give a bit of an insight about why we, why we do the awards and, and why they're important to us. So I'll hand over for Victoria to start. Hi everybody, it's great to see you here. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Victoria. I work with Haley at the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance. Um, and we partner every year on Creativity and Wellbeing Week with London Arts and Health. It's really great to see Anna here as well. So this is uh, the last of our, our curated events for Creativity and Wellbeing Week. And uh, yes, yeah, great to have you here with us. Um, for audio description, I'm a white woman in my 40s with short brown hair in a sort of cream room and I'm wearing glasses and some big, uh, what are these things called? Headphones. I always go blank on that. So we launched these awards in winter 2019 and really everything changed a few months after that. Um, but despite that, we've, we've carried on working with our partners on these awards and we feel that the themes that we established back then, collective power, practitioner well-being, and climate are even more relevant and important than they were back in 2019. And at the moment with the cost of living crisis on top of COVID, we're being faced more than ever by the impacts of inequalities across this country. We recognize as we did last year that we can't move forward without addressing the connections between our work and health and cultural inequalities, specifically the ongoing impacts of structural racism, ableism, social economic exclusion in both the cultural and the health sectors. Right through the pandemic, and now as we begin to emerge, hopefully, we've seen the cultural health and wellbeing sector, creative health, respond with creativity, with imagination, and with great kindness to meet intersecting global crises, as well as local need and individual difficulties and challenges and, and loss in many cases. As partnership and collaboration have driven innovation and greater reach, the need to find ways to systematically support well-being respond to the climate and ecological emergency uh, and its relationship with global and local inequalities is becoming ever clearer. So why do we do these awards? Um, firstly, they create a platform where we can amplify and collectively celebrate the work of projects, organizations and people who are really leading the way and who are learning from this challenging time to, to build a better, different and a better future. And the awards also provide a meeting point. We know from previous winners and audiences at the award gatherings that creating a moment for collective reflection and togetherness for the sector has been an important anchor and also a chance for us to mutually support and learn from each other. The awards have also um, sparked curiosity and connection. Um, through the awards, we've met and heard about practice that we wouldn't have in any other way. The awards are also a mechanism for us at the Alliance to listen and learn from the sector. We learn not just from the winners, but all the people who apply to these awards. Um, we read all the applications very carefully. We often use those applications as case studies for specific projects. And what we've learned from them has influenced core pieces of our work, whether that's the practitioner support resource that we've developed over the last year or so, um, our, our um, Thriving to Surviving report that we published earlier this year, um, the Accelerator report that we launched earlier this week with Julie's Bicycle, and I know also that our partners are, are learning from these awards too. Nicola's referenced um, the Practicing Well Awards in her own research, so it's a really important source of information for us. And most importantly, we also feel that the awards give us and our partners an opportunity to keep these vital conversations alive about the things that are really important to us and to the sector. So meaningful co-production, intersectional thinking to meet crises, but also building this sense of a, a culture of care that really supports everyone involved in this work. So they, you know, they proclaim our values while also and prompt others to consider how they're working and its broader impact on people, place and planet. And the awards are constantly evolving, as is our practice over this time, in response to what we learn and what we hear. And we're, we're looking forward to seeing what will come through the awards this year. Um, and that we, and at this point, we'd really just like to thank all the applicants who have always have applied, but also our awards partners for their generosity and their time and commitment 
to contributing to the shared and collective learning um, celebration and progression. So on that point, uh, I'm now going to hand over um, to our partners for the Climate Award. Uh, it's Hilary Jennings from Happy Museums Project and Victoria Burns from the Culture Declares Emergency. Thank you. On mute. Uh, thank you, Hayley. Uh, my name is Victoria Burns and I'm the National Coordinator for Culture Declares um, Climate and Ecological Emergency. I'm a white woman. Uh, I'm, I have black curly hair, um, light skin, red lipstick on. I'm wearing a, a red necklace and a cream top and I'm sitting in a, a little office with cupboards behind me and I'm not going to tell you what's in the cupboards. In fact, I don't think I know what's in those cupboards or I want to know. Um, anyway, um, I'm really excited to introduce the CHWA Award 2022 Climate Award um, and I'll tell you a little background about it and our hopes for this award. Okay. Health inequality and climate are interwoven consequences of how we as humans treat the world around us and one another. Joining forces with the CHWA Happy Museum Projects and Culture Declares, we want to shine a light on the people and projects using creativity and culture to, to address these challenges. We're looking for projects and organizations that are recognizing the connections between climate, health inequalities, and creativity and culture. Submissions could include projects that link health, um, mental health, climate justice, and creativity, for example, or connect nature, culture, and well-being. They might be about building safe and brave places, grassroots movements, internal campaigns that are raising awareness, or organisations instigating systemic changes in approaches to procurement, commissioning, and the selection of work and resources. These are just some suggestions, and we're happy to be surprised and delighted by practice we've never considered before. Um, so I'll hand to Hilary to tell us about Happy Museum. Thank you, Victoria. So I'm Hilary Jennings, the Happy Museum. Uh, I'm a middle-aged white woman with short, fair hair and tortoise shells. I'm wearing a turquoise flowery dress and I'm in my sitting room. Um, so Happy Museum offers a challenge to society's focus on economic growth as, as a direction of travel. And we put the well-being of people, place and planet at the heart of our work with their flourishing as our goal. Since 2012, we've been working with museums across the UK and beyond creating a community of practice focused on reimagining the role of museums for a regenerative future. We love being involved in the awards and we love being inspired by all the great entrants. The winner of last year's Climate Award, Cody Dock, was recognised for joining the dots and described as an outstanding project which was ambitious, multi-solving, place-based, concrete and creative. If that doesn't make you want to go and check it out, I don't know what does. Um, driven by the people, power of volunteers and the needs of the local community. And in response to the impacts of climate change, this project provides sustained activity, creating deep impact for the well-being of its neighbourhood and its inhabitants. Although it's strongly rooted in lived experience and committed to the regeneration of its place, the approach of the project is curious and expansive, and it seeks and facilitates opportunities to build international connections and alternative perspectives into the fold. The judges were also excited about the potential of the project to grow more connections, it's being rooted in creative industries quarter and its influence on, as an exemplar of holistic thinking for the sector, encouraging more people to consider how they can engage with their assets, be it physical space, community connections and heritage, to connect the dots and make lasting change. So I'm really, Delighted we're joined today by Ben Bishop, who's Citizen Science and Environment Manager from the project. Hi, Ben. Um, thanks for joining today's session. Where are you calling from? I think you've got a number of sites, haven't you? Um, no, we only have one site. We're based yeah. in East London. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm currently sitting in uh, one of our small office spaces that we um, usually rent out, but it's empty at the moment. I wanted a nice, quiet space to speak to you all. Um, I am a 28 year old white male and I'm wearing a bright orange high vis jacket because we're a working site as much as a community space. Brilliant. I think you were in high vis last time we saw you. And <laughs> I'm what... always in high vis. <laughs> <laughs> um, could you tell us a little bit? It'd be interesting to hear what, what it meant to win the Climate Award and maybe just, you know, what's been happening with you since that time, what the impact has been. 
Um, it was, uh, I think for the community, like, and all the volunteers involved, it was really um, a really powerful thing to help sort of solidify the work that they've been doing and they are still doing. So I think it was, it was just really nice to be recognized. And I think um, it had a real impact on, you know, all the different people that come here and get involved from, you know, people that are here, like maybe once a month to, you know, really regular um, volunteers. So it's a really nice moment to say, look, we're doing some really good work. Um, since then, obviously, we we have a really long term um, regeneration project that we're doing to reopen the space um, to its full extent to allow people to engage with all of the different things that we're doing to do that as well. So um, we've obviously achieved some of the milestones in that journey. Um, so one of them being opening some of these um, creative studios to get more people involved in the site and give them a space to then engage with the local community. And hopefully, you know, some of them are also from the local community as well. Um, we've come to the end of a really big piece of funding as well, which was um, funded by DEFRA for the Green Recovery Challenge, which is kind of coming to an end next week. So we've achieved a lot of um, sort of green goals within that, you know, sort of from tree planting around the local area, doing some really cool um, citizen science surveys that have helped us record biodiversity data for the local area. Um, we've even supported, even though they are a developer, we've even supported a local developer that's got access to a site that's um, basically it's a disused gas work site and it's really important for uh, nature conservation in the local area so we went in with our volunteers to help them find out what's going on there to start thinking about how they transform it and hopefully transform it for a positive as opposed to more you know housing that's not necessarily going to benefit the local community. Brilliant it's great to hear things going from strength to strength Victoria, I don't know something you'd like to add. Yeah, I just wondered um, how your thinking might have developed in relation to uh, joining the docs around creativity and health and climate injustices. Um, so I think for, um, after, after receiving the award and obviously starting to think more about how we um, are in this sort of sphere of work, you know, working very much with people's, you know, own space and actually what you know they can get out of being part of a project like this um thinking more about how actually it has a positive um input to their own well-being and actually how they have the same like there's that cross pollination you know people coming here and bringing their own thing and their own experience you know it it benefits the community but also just doing something and being involved in the community benefits them i think that's one of the big things that we're really trying to work towards understanding more of, so like more of like the social impact of some of the things that we do and uh, monitoring that, you know, thinking about different processes like, for example, social, social prescribing or um, green prescribing, like, you know, how maybe we can work more with um, different groups and target people more to, you know, actually have a direct benefit and not just say this is going to benefit everyone it's actually how is it going to benefit this specific group and work backwards so actually get them to say what they would like as opposed to us saying we think you want this <laughs> um yeah so we i mean one of the things we did um was worked with the schools on exhibiting their, their climate protest work so we worked with a group of um schools from around newham that worked with schools in Garda and they um, they came and they actually were able to curate the event themselves so the teachers worked with the kids to say you know okay you've got all of this artwork what's it going to look like when we put it up and things like that so getting it more from that level as opposed to from above down. Yeah that's fantastic really inspiring thank you so much. Yeah, so, well, many thanks, Ben. Thank you for joining us and, and calling in from, from the office. Um, no problem. <laughs> and, uh, many thanks to Victoria and Hilary uh, too uh, for kind of giving us that overview to the Climate Award uh, for this year. Um, so I'm going to move on now to uh, Nicola Naismith. Um, she's an artist researcher and author of The Artist Practicing Well, 
and Practicing Well Conversations and Support menu of reports. And she's going to introduce the Practicing Well Award. Uh, this award aims to uncover and celebrate work happening in the sector to support practitioners and think more about how we can grow ecologies of care for everyone um, involved. So Nicola, over to you. Thanks Hayley, and uh, lovely to be here today and to see everybody. Yes, um, my name is Nicola Naismith. I'm a visual artist and researcher and a partner for the Practicing Well Award. Uh, for audio description, I'm a white woman in my 40s uh, with short hair, wearing glasses, dark top in a bright orange room. So um, the Practicing Well Award um, is about practitioner well-being and support. And that's a reoccurring um, concern and priority for all of us working in health, arts for health and well-being. So working in collaboration with the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance, this award aims to focus on practice, which is leading the way in championing, delivering and embedding. And I think that's the really important part, actually, for me, I think embedding practitioner care into project design, commissioning and management. So this year we're inviting artists or museum or heritage practitioners to nominate commissioners, employers, peers or organisations for practitioner support projects or programmes or initiatives that they have engaged with. And new for this year, we're also inviting organisations to self nominate in collaboration with a practitioner, a project or initiative or way of working, which is focused on practitioner support. So there's those two categories within uh, which people can make applications within. And today I'm really pleased that I'm joined uh, by um, Debbie Geraghty from Plymouth, Plymouth Music Zone, the first ever winners of the Practicing Well Award back in 2020. And I very clearly remember reviewing the shortlisted entries that year because it was the last time I worked in person before we went into lockdown. Um, so in that uh, shortlisting um, meeting with the other judges, we had an expansive discussion about how to single out a winner. And it was clear when we were reviewing, when reading one application in particular, that it was the breadth and depth of their practitioner support that really stood out. The support was described as a hub, which offered a range of activities, including work shadowing opportunities, snapshot observations, skills pods, pastoral support and supervision. Furthermore, practitioners were also employed to deliver training to peer groups, which indicated to us the value placed upon their experiences. The support was also financially accessible with paid time to attend and engage in training and support activities. The organisation had created a model of support which is embedded within its structure and the workplace work culture and in so doing we felt raise the support expectations of creative practitioners. So Plymouth Music Zone's model was leading the way and had the potential to be widely adapted and, and applied to other organisations working in arts for health and wellbeing. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Debbie and um, to introduce herself and we're just going to have a bit of a conversation about their experiences of winning the award, but also to learn about the work that they continue to grow and develop in this space. So hello Debbie, um, yeah. and welcome. Hello. So for the purposes of audio description, I'm a white woman who's slightly blushing because of your lovely words, I have to say. Um, I'm in my mid fifties. I'm wearing a sort of aubergine uh, shirt. I'm in my home office. I've got a very colourful sofa to my right, and I've got a guitar that hasn't been played in a while. <laughs> it's to my left, um, and it's really uh, lovely to be here. Um, it is so funny, isn't it? Listening to when people write about your organisation and what's been happening, and you. I mean, even though we spent twenty two years doing exactly what you've said. Um, we kind of, when you hear it back, um, it kind of feels strange in a way, but actually really touching. I'm very, you know, and this whole award in terms of what it, you know, what it meant to us to get it, I think because it came at a very powerful time, as you've just described, uh, Nicola, you know, it was, it was like during a really powerful moment in time, wasn't it? You know, during lockdown and everything, and particularly for uh, our organization, we got it in November, I think 2020. And, you know, I was personally off uh, on long term sick leave because I got COVID at the 
outset of the pandemic. And then that went on to become long COVID. So I was watching um, Facebook, in fact, is when I found out we'd won this award because I was on, you know, and it was so bizarre to be looking at it from that place as well. And I could see how happy the team were. There were tears and I was crying on the sofa as well because I was so sort of moved by it. And during that time when I was off, I was off for like 15 months, um, which is a long time, but I was very aware that this kind of ecosystem we had created, uh, created of well-being and, and support that had been embedded um, was just self-generating that reflective practice. It kept everybody safe during the most bizarre time and most challenging time that we you know that we all went through. So it was it was showing its worth uh, in action. And and for for us, it was about um, really recognizing the power of uh, uh, and, and the skills of frontline practitioners. Um, we were very clear years and years ago when we started working uh, cross sectorally with you know education and health and social care. We were working pre pandemic up to like with up to like 100 partners every year. Um, and to be able to have a music leader who was able to work across a diverse range of people and communities and all those different sectors is is so highly skilled. So we were very aware from the very beginning of the importance of workforce development and the importance of support uh, and well-being as part of this kind of embedded embedded model. Um, and we realized there was no way we could train them outside of that. We had to do it ourselves. So that's why it's been a very kind of responsive model. So to win that award was just so beautiful. I mean, I really wish I had the award here with me. It's It's got pride of place that, you know, Plymouth Music Zone, as you just come in, it's like, ah, it's like celestial choirs of angels coming out from behind it. Not bird song as you had at the beginning, but choirs of angels. Um, and it's a beautiful award in itself because it's handcrafted. It's made by an artist, it's handcrafted, and it exudes value and care. It exudes intention of value and care, which is exactly what our Music Leader Support Hub was all about. It was about firmly and really intentionally trying to persuade funders of the need for this sort of investment. Uh, the need in terms of not just supporting the people themselves, but the need in terms of the impact that it then created, the need in terms of the quality and the depth of the practice that you get, the need in terms of um, being able to attract and retain really good people who feel like they belong in a place, therefore they'll feel that they want to do good work uh, in, in terms of making change in the world. Um, so when we look at that award and when we got that award, that's what it reminded us of was just, yes, that's what it's about. So we love that award. It means it means a lot, as you can probably gather. Oh, that it's so it I it feels great to hear the way that you talk about how those um foundations around practitioner support that were well established before we hit this massive bump of the pandemic have has has helped to to take the organization and the work that you do through the pandemic and all of those additional challenges that not only creative practitioners are facing but also organizations and you know managers and leaders within them as well are there things that that have changed throughout the pandemic in the way that you think about practitioner support um i think it's just become more complex mm -hmm. um at so many levels right across the organization and we've always tried to make sure that our practitioners are not only just seen as practitioners and music leaders who are kind of i mean from the very beginning we wanted our sessional music leaders to be integrated across the whole team um so we wanted provision that was yeah it was just for all of us um and during this time particularly with me coming back after 15 months they're like who are you <laughs> Oh, yeah, she's back. Um, uh, trying to reintegrate into 
a changed landscape of an organization has been a fascinating experience in itself. Um, and in terms of seeing what's happened with everybody's well-being, um, and those systems really responded and, um, and, and were shaped to what the needs were during that particular time. But I do think that the complexity of the emotional impact in all these different settings that we've been working in um, has just become more involved than before. So I think that uh, moving forward, I'm really fascinated about looking at what it would be like to have an organization that's much more trauma informed across as an organization. I mean, we do have individuals who are trauma informed um, and I have a particular interest in that myself as well. But what would that be like as an organization to really impact that self-awareness? Um, what would it be like as an organization to really step up people's ability to set boundaries um, and our own ability to be able to set boundaries with our cross-sectoral partners because you could you know we talk about the pmz the plymouth museum bubble people come in and they're like this place is weird nobody's you know it's, it's trying to role model an inclusive community and it does it well but when you're working in other places that's not necessarily the case they're not necessarily thinking of music leaders um, to the to the extent that they probably should be. So the question is, how can we have those conversations with other health and social care type organizations? How can we learn from them and how can they learn from us as well so that we can uh, collectively collaborate on those kind of expectations so that we do keep people safe? Obviously, during a pandemic, there's an increase in, um, you know, things that happen, people, you know, dying that impact on our music leaders finding out information you know after a year of not being in touch with that particular community all of these sort of things are happening so there's a bit of a um it's almost like i don't know it, it's a sort of hangover effect so to speak of that long period of lockdown so we're just kind of unpicking that and trying to trying to slow down in a sense in order to be able to consolidate in order to be able to heal some of what has happened uh, during this time, uh, which is really hard when you're trying to rebuild the organization at the same time. How can you look after people and say, look, we need to stop, but we need to get a hold on and get, get a funding bid in at the same time. Come on, whoa, whoa, but stop, but stop. You know, so you've got these kind of mixed messages going on. And, and the question is, how do we do that safely um, to keep people's well-being front and center? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, the way in which you talk about the work that you've already done, the way that you're thinking about how things have been in the pandemic and how things will go into the future, the things that you're thinking about that slowing down while needing to keep going, it just reiterates to me what a worthy winner Plymouth Music Zone was. Mm. Thank you so much for your time. I know you've got to dash off in a little bit, but thank you so much for being with us. And I'm going to pass over to Hayley, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, big thank you for me as well, Debbie. Thank you for those insights. Um, so yes, we're going to move on to the next award now, which is the Collective Power Award. And this is in partnership with the Ideas Alliance and the Lived Experience Network. Um, and I'm, I'm very chuffed to introduce Giovanni and Ma from The Lens. Uh, they're both co-directors uh, for the Lived Experience Network and are going to give us uh, the, uh, yeah, the introduction to the Collective Power Award. So I'll hand over to Giovanni. Thank you, Hayley. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, my name is Giovanni Vigino. I'm uh, one of the co-directors uh, of the Lived Experience Network, The Lens. Um, I'm a biomedical engineer. I am uh, very passionate about interdisciplinary creative collaborations. Um, for audio description, I'm a white men in my 30s. Uh, I have a brown hair, blue shirt, and I have a white wall behind me with some paintings. And um, let's, uh, let's, yes, let's introduce, well, I first actually pass on to Matt to introduce herself and then we introduce the award. <laughs> Thanks, Giovanni. Hi, uh, my name is Mahrana, and I'm also one of the co-directors of um, The Lens, and I'm one of the London champions. And for 
audio description, I'm a woman uh, in my mid fifties, uh, have white hair, glasses and brown skin. Um, and I'll uh, pass you back to uh, Giovanni, who's going to um, introduce a concept for the Create uh, Collective Power Award. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, so here's the concept for the Collective Power Award. Together, we're stronger. The award aims to recognize an inspiring project, consortium, collective, or movement of people in which meaningful partnership and co-production have improved the health and well-being of individuals and communities through culture and creativity. So um, we are keen as the lens also to hear about different scales of collaboration from small grassroots initiatives and emerging virtual communities to sector-wide consortiums. And the work may address um, specific well-being needs of local residents in a street or challenges limiting social societal uh, beliefs or inequalities experienced by communities of people. So um, there is an increasing focus on co-production and lived experience, which is very close to the lens as a network. Um, and um, it is very important to highlight examples of co-production that are embedded in planning, uh, design, and delivery. For this reason, all types of groups and collectives are invited to apply. Um, these will need to be a constituted group, legal entity, or established organization. The key is meaningful partnerships and collaboration, bringing together different fields of practice and lived experience. So last year, um, we were excited to see a diverse mix of interpretations of what collective power meant to people from large place based multi organizational multi sector responses to small grassroots people led initiatives. And so we're curious to see what emerges this year as people begin to grapple with a new world. Um, so we have um, Matt here from Outside Edge Theatre, who was one of the winners uh, last year. Um, and they're um, regularly described as life-saving by the people they support and work with. And the Outside Edge Theatre and the work that it does continues to present a strong resonance with the collective power theme. Um, and being responsive and people-led and constantly pivoting and adapting to challenges throughout the pandemic Outside Edge Theatre continue to provide creative and practical solutions for the community it served, enabling people to build their resilience and to be creative and to connect with others, both emotionally and digitally. Their innovative work reminded us of how many cultural and creative organisations stepped up and supported their communities to survive and adapt to a variety of challenges by providing access to technology, digital equipment, and much more. Um, and last year, the judges also felt that there was a richness in the creative delivery of the work that Outside Edge Theatre does, with multiple layers of storytelling that provides an outlet for people to feel listened to and find value in their own lived experience. And through public performances, they challenge the perceptions that face a marginalized and often stigmatized community. And with an ever-growing list of partners and collaborators, they invest their investment in staff and their volunteers demonstrated a positive commitment to take lessons learned from the pandemic to shape the future of their work with an emphasis on collaborative, caring, and the progressive nature in their work. So, we're thrilled to welcome Outside Edge Theatre's Artistic Director, Matt Steinberg, who is going to share with us some of his perspectives of being involved with the CHWA Award. So, hello, Matt, and thanks for joining us uh, today. And um, how are you and how's everyone at Outside Edge Theatre? Um, uh, hi, Giovanni. Uh, we're, we're doing well, though it's, uh, it's a rainy day here in East London. Um, for audio description purposes, uh, I'm a male in the final days of my 30s. I have curly, what used to be quite brown hair, which is now progressively turning white through a global pandemic. Uh, I'm wearing black glasses and a black 
uh, shirt with white stripes and I'm in our fairly bland local authority arts community hub space in East London Tower Hamlets. Um, in, I guess in, in, in terms of the, um, I, I should, I, I guess I should sort of say, uh, what, what Ma, Ma did a really quite beautiful description, I suppose, of the work that we do at Outside Ed, but I think one of the key things that, that was left out was the, the community that we work with are people who are affected by addiction. So we, we work with, uh, we are, well, in the midst of, but we work with people within a recovery community. And it's that sense of community, I think, which, which you know, we leaned very heavily into and onto throughout the pandemic and, and, and which I think for us has been one of the, the most important elements to guide us through the delivery of our work to meet the needs of the, you know, the, the very complex needs of the beneficiaries you know, of our organization. So we're the UK's only theater company and participatory arts charity with a focus on addiction. And we deliver free drama and now creative writing and dance and other creative activities to people who are affected by addiction. That can be people who are in active addiction, people who are in recovery, family members of those affected by addiction, champions of those who are in recovery or you know, dealing with addiction. So it, it shouldn't come as a surprise that the, the, the range of people that we work with have a range of very complex needs. So the work that we're doing has to always be very holistic in its approach to supporting them. Um, and I think that that was one of the things that, that winning the Collective Power Award last year um, recognized and you know it's I, I I guess I would say as, as the artistic director and CEO of a very small scrappy grassroots organization there's very little time for reflection and so when and when a uh, an external organization recognizes the work that you're doing and and sort of slows you down and, and forces you I suppose to reflect on it uh, it can be quite a powerful experience um, I think it was it was only sort of through formulating, I guess, maybe the application, but also sort of our response to actually winning the award that we started as, a, as an organization to really think through, well, what has, what has allowed us to, to, to remain responsive? What has allowed us to, you know, to grow our capacity across a, you know, a global pandemic um, to work with about 50% more service users every year than we did before? So you know, in 2019-20, we worked with about 230 people. Last year, our draft numbers would indicate that we worked with 455 people, but our organization hasn't really grown. We've taken on one additional full-time staff member to support with outreach with a bit of administration, but we're still a really you know, small team that then works with a, a, a pool of freelancers, of freelance artists with lived experience of addiction. Um, I guess, you know, in, in, in reflecting, what we realized is that very quickly, we became much more values led as an organization than we ever had been before. And so we didn't quite know, I suppose, what to hold on to. And so we held on to our core value, which was to be service user led. And that was something that the award very clearly recognized for us was that there was great value in, you know, in, in listening to and responding to and working with, co-creating with the recovery community that we were located in. Um, of course, it, it's the, winning the award raised the profile of our company and our work, which which has been amazing. But it really was the celebration of that value of the peer led work that we were doing and working with artists with lived experience to deliver work to a vast number of people um, that, you know, that, that that I think we hadn't really been recognized for doing before. Um, it's. I think that one of the things that we sort of realized is that through working more closely with our community and working with volunteers and training up volunteers to then become paid facilitators, it made us a more sustainable charity. And I think throughout the pandemic, we've, we've come to realize that actually our greatest asset, because we work, we work in an asset-based approach, apparently. I say that because I write it all the time in funding applications, but we really do. I mean, we work with people to identify what their strengths are, what their assets are. But we realized as an organization, our greatest asset that was our community. It was the people that we worked with. It was our beneficiary group. And so by, by increasing the number of volunteers that we worked with, by training those volunteers to become paid facilitators and growing our capacity to have a lived experience workforce, it meant that we became much more sustainable as a charity. And we've now grown not just the number of beneficiaries we're deliv delivering to, but also the number of weekly activities, which has grown from four weekly activities before the pandemic to now 13. 
And that's very much in response to the needs of the people that we're working with and listening to them and hearing what it is that they needed, you know, all, it felt like sometimes on a day to day basis. And it's, uh, you know, in that sense, Matt, it's great to hear about the work you do with communities. But can you just tell us what co creation means to you and to Outside Edge? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's the center of everything that we do because you know, if if we didn't if we didn't co create with the beneficiaries or with the service users, we would just cease to be in or we would cease to have a need to exist. It, we have to everything that we're doing has to be about working with them and for them and on their behalf. Um, I think that one of the things that we've as we've sort of raised our own awareness about co-creation or co-production, I've got to say, as a theater company, I, I shy away from calling it co-production because it gets very confusing with co-producing theater productions with other organizations. So we've we've tried to change the terminology internally to be co-creator, co-design, because co-produce sounds like we're both putting money into something, and that's not that's definitely not the case with the community members we're working with. Um, but when we co-design or co-create with with our community, we we've we've realized that it's a very it's a slow burn process and we're, we're now celebrating that rather than finding that a barrier. So I think, you know, when we, when we first started to really think of ourselves as a co-designing or co-creating or, you know, arts organization, we thought, well, it's got to be quick. Like, you know, we have to have a single, a single sort of co-design session and then be able to go and achieve that outcome immediately with, you know, within the next 12 months. But actually what we've realized is that, our entire organization has to be about facilitating the co-creation or co-design process. And so we've slowly started to implement uh, or integrate master classes, for instance, into our program of work across a year. So every month now we have a master class, which based on sort of interests and needs from within the beneficiary group, we'll find different practitioners that can, that can show expertise or skills in a certain area. So when we do these bigger co-design, co-production sessions now, we can we can reference back to experiences that you know that the beneficiaries have had over the past 12 months or 24 months, which they never would have had before. So it's difficult to ask for a clowning activity if you've never experienced clowning before or musical theater is something that they did last weekend. So we're we're really trying to 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 think of ourselves as a as, as a facilitator and a bridge towards different kinds of art forms, different kinds of practices, and then be, be an enabler to, to take the needs and the interests of the people that we're working with and make those projects happen so that they have a rich creative experience that, that you know, that, that's informed rather than um, chosen for them. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you, Matt, and uh, congratulations again to you and Outside Edge. I hand back to Hayley. Thank you so much, uh, Matt, for those for those insights and um, for sharing your experience with us today.